Welcome to Lanarkshire Family History Society's webinar for February. My name is Claire Wilson and I will be your host this evening. My co-host tonight is Christine Woodcock. Christine, how are things? Good. I feel like a rookie though. I've, it's been so long since I've played this end of the Zoom, so <laughs> I'm hitting all the wrong buttons here. I think we're just having one of those nights, aren't we? Um, so we would be obliged if you would turn your cameras and sound um, off until the presentation is over. It just helps to keep the background noise to a minimum so that everyone can enjoy the webinar and hopefully it will stop any delays or screens freezing. Please pop a note into the chat box and tell us where you are watching from today. And if you found anything exciting in your research so far this year as well. Christine, Kilted Culture, where are we? Where are, are we? Are you going to share? No, I wasn't, but I can give you some information. I wasn't yeah. going to share my screen. Is that what you were expecting? I wasn't you've sure. Got, <laughs> you've, got high, you've got high hopes today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, but we are we are well underway with that. We've got, uh, hi, John. We have, um, our a big event is coming up. Our first big event is coming up in March on the 19th. And we are going to be talking about emigration, immigration. Uh, so we have Dr. Marjorie Harper, we have Dr. Keir Strickland, who is an archaeologist who did excavations through, through the Strath of Kildonan. Uh, we have somebody from the NRS, Jessica, who is going to talk about the Highlands and Islands Emigration Society uh, and their database. And then I'll be talking about the Scots that came into Atlantic Canada. Yep, so very so exciting. Exciting and... Lots going on in, ancestor, in Celted Ancestors. Yeah. Lots going on, Kilted Ancestors. It's been going really well, and we've had quite a few speakers on at the moment. It is free. I will put details into the chat box for anyone who wants to come along and join in. Um, I think there's people sitting in the waiting room, actually. Hold on. Correct them in. Um, so, yeah, we're getting there. Uh, we also have the event for October. Up, I think now, have you got the booking ready for that, Chris? I do. It'll so we're going live with that tomorrow morning. Um, so right. uh, anybody who signs up for all four events by uh, before the March event will get free registration for the October event. But we have that as a standalone that you can purchase, and that's when we will help you bring all of that information together to create your family story. Yeah, so it's a, a really good topic for Year of Stories and that, you know, you get all the, trip, the, the tips and tricks and there's a workshop in among it, a writing workshop um, to pull your own family stories. So it's, it's quite good, actually, when you look at, you know, even Kilted Ancestors and some of the topics, um, that, you know, and, and even the Kilted Culture Conference, it's a good way of taking that information that you're sharing with everyone and then perhaps getting it written down closer to the end of the year. Mm -hmm. I'll put details for both events into the chat box as well. Um, so I'd like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Irene O'Brien of Glasgow City Archives. Irene's talk tonight will cover merchants and craftsmen and will look at the role merchants and craftsmen played on our history. She will tell us more about the wide variety of records available that will help, um, help to tell the story of our ancestors from the 16th to the 20th centuries. Irene, how are you this evening? I'm wonderful. <laughs> I'm doing fine, thank you. Good, that's good. I've got quite a lot of attendees and a lot of excitement um, over this talk. I even had people messaging me last night saying, I can't make it. Where can I view it? Where can I view it afterwards? So yeah, a lot of excitement. It's a big one, I think, because it gets into records that most of us are not familiar with. Yeah. So. We're looking yeah. forward to this one. Don't disappoint Irene. <laughs> and I mean, it's, 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 it's one of those ones that's really it's good. It's no pressure. Yeah. It's, it's good for the, the pre-1855 records, if you can. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so well, I think if you're ready, Irene, we'll just I am over. indeed. Excellent. Okay, um, so I'm delighted to be here. Um, well, I'm in my own house, but delighted to be speaking to the group tonight. I'm going to talk about the I'm going to talk about the merchants and craftsmen of Glasgow. Um, but some of this applies across Scotland in terms of other boroughs. Um, so we're going to look at some of the resources here. 
I'm going to give you an overview of the city archives first of all, just to give you an idea of how what we have and how far back it goes. I'm going to talk about, of course, the merchants and craftsmen. In particular, I'm going to talk about um, the role in Glasgow's history. Um, we're very involved in the council, so I'm going to look at that. And then there are particular records that relate to merchants and crafts as organisations. Um, I should say we have the merchant's house, we've got the trade's house, but we've got all 14 crafts for Glasgow. Um, so it's a very wide collection going right back um, to mid Middle Ages, right up to the present day. But of course, it, you, you will find details of merchants in particular, not only in um, their records, but in terms of families and estates. And we've got lots of family and estate records which will include them. And we've also got lots of records of individual merchants um, and their companies. So there's quite a lot of different things you can be accessing to look for these merchants and craftsmen. I'm going to look at some of the clubs and societies they might belong to, including that. But I'm going to talk about some of the burial um, yards, which are exclusively for merchants or include lots of them. Um, and I'm going to look at things like property registers and the register of deeds, just to suggest some other sources that you might use. And we'll look at some of those standard sources like voters' roles, etc. And obviously they have votes long before most of the population. So it's a quite a good way of finding out about them. So if I start with the city and the local and um, the Glasgow City Archives itself, and um, we are the largest local authority archives in Scotland. We were the first local authority archives established in Scotland, and it was established in 1964. And it brought brought to Glasgow and brought to Scotland the very first professional archivist. Um, so although the National Records of Scotland had existed for a long time, they intended to employ lawyers and academics. So Richard Dell, who came up from, down, from the south of England, um, was the first professional archivist to be appointed to run an archive service in Scotland. The records go from the 12th to the 21st century, and these cover both the official records, I mean the records of the council itself, but also a large number of private records. What do they do? They tell us the story of Glasgow that grew from a small cathedral town in the 12th century to a great merchant city in the 18th the, the, the 18th to the 20th century. And it became the second city of empire and it becomes a great industrial power um, house by the end of the 19th century. And what did that do? It attracted large numbers of migrants from across Scotland and large numbers from Ireland and elsewhere um, across the UK and across the world. You can't underestimate, you can't overestimate the importance these crafts and corporations had in the history of the city. Um, and particularly in the middle, they were formed in the Middle Ages and were an important part of Borough life, both then and in later centuries. These, these, borough, these um, merchants and these crafts would, would exist in other boroughs across Scotland and elsewhere right across Europe. And they always played a really leading, leading role in the history of that area and the government of that area. There was tension between those making the goods and those selling them. So those making the goods were the craftsmen. And those craftsmen enjoyed privileged positions. So they'd organised organize it. So they, only those who who were regulated could work at each craft. Um, so they actually, it was a closed shop, I suppose you would say in terms of modern, um, modern um, parlance, it was definitely a closed shop. But of course, of course the craftsmen, they were much larger in number in the Middle Ages, much larger in number than the merchants, but it was the merchants that monopolized the magistrate and the borough's finances. So those were the people who had political power. They were very much resented by the craftsmen who wished to be part of the town's government. Um, so there was lots of trouble between them. And again, that was not unique to Glasgow, it was something that existed elsewhere. Um, so what happened in 1605, there was a letter of Gildry, and that's which resolved the tension. So what it did was establish the constitution for both a merchant's house and a trade's house, and we have the records of those establishments. And but what it also did was lay down the formal role in the council. And because of that formal role in the council, you will find many of the merchants were Lord Provost and Bailey's of the city. And so really important and real movers and shakers and movers in the city's history. And, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And they had those political powers um, right up, up to 1833. The craftsmen, when their ancient schools of rage and trade and lights were abolished in 1846. 
I know if you ever write that in Facebook, they will tell you the Dina Guild, who was the head of that, um, she still still attended Glasgow Corporation um, Council right up to 1975, but they had no powers at all. They always had a charitable role, but that becomes their main activity from 1833. So there's the, the role that they played, the political role, the charitable role, and we're going to talk about some of that as well. In terms of the burgesses, I'm sure you've all heard the burgesses. Um, these were under the agreement in 1605, there was a guild brethren established. And that meant that every resident burgess to, who entered the guild brethren in payment of the to the hospital of his calling. So if you're a merchant, you paid it to the merchant's hospital. Or if you're a craftsman, you would paid it to the trades hospital. Oh, sorry, I was a bit quick there. I was just trying to get away my screen at the bottom there. Um, what happened was, it's, what happened was they could do that and their son or son-in-law could pay 20 pound an entry five shillings into the hospital is calling. He must be worth in lands and heritage, movable up to 500 marks. Um, and so there was definite limitations about who, who could join these and they did have to some money, have some money. I'm just going to give you an idea, just a very quick idea of how the population rose. And that's very much largely to, due to the rise of the merchants. Um, and you can see um, at the beginning here, there was only 7,000 in Glasgow, the 1,600. And you can see it going up. Um, and then look, if you look at 1801, it goes up a huge amount from 77,000 to 329,000. And then by 1901, it's some three quarters of a million. And by 1921, it's over, over a, quite a bit over a million. That growth, particularly in the early, early area, was absolutely to do with the rise of merchants. When Glasgow becomes a great merchant city, dominating tobacco and a world leader in terms of tobacco and then dominating sugar trade as well. I should say, of course, that this... Um, what this was, was in fact, they dominated, they were very, in fact, they relied on slavery. So a lot of the merchants in the tobacco trade and the sugar trade absolutely relied on slavery. And the city's got a big, uh, a big project now called Legacy of Empire. There's going to be a report done uh, by Stephen Mullen, who some of you might know in terms of some aspects of the Legacy of Empire in terms of the city. Um, but there's a lot of work going on in terms of that. But there's no doubt that Glasgow's Glasgow's history very much is the history of merchants um, who actually made Glasgow what it was today. So the merchants, they had to be a, a burgess and they had, to, they had a right to trade in the city. So they had to be a membership of the cha a charitable hospital. They were examined by the Dina Guild. It was mean tested and you can see the amount. It may not look a lot of money now, but if you imagine that that was like 1605, it was a huge amount. Um, you will often find them in apprenticeship registers um, and they'll be shown to do seven years service under the Glasgow merchants. They could also serve apprenticeship with tradesmen, um, but then a Burgess fee had to be paid for entry. That's really important because it, even though your ancestor was a trademan, it does, it does indicate that you ought to be checking the merchant's house records as well. And it's very much based in families, so the sons of sons-in-law of Burgesses could get in free. Um, some paid 10 marks. And, and an entry to the merchant's guild more difficult, so you needed to be worth 500 marks or 27 pound. The sons and sons-in-law has bypassed these restrictions. So you can see it's very much a club that people had to actually have some money. It wasn't just enough to be a merchant, you actually had to have some substantial cash. Now I mentioned earlier, we've got all 14 crafting corporations and um, some of the records go back, they, none of them goes back as far as that in terms of the records, but there are other records that do within their collection. So they go from the 13th to the 20th century. Um, so very early indeed. I'm going to talk about, and I'll show one or two entries relating to that. We also have in addition to the, the merchants and craftsmen for Glasgow, um, we have Anderson Weavers, we have Govan Weavers, and we have Carlton Weavers, and we've got um, the records of other Weavers as well. So it's not just Glasgow, it's an area beyond that. One of the things that is very difficult, because very often some of these names don't mean a lot to us nowadays, 
Um, so there's, I'm just mentioning some of them here, but if you look at this chain here, it will tell you all the 14 incorporations. Some are very obvious, that you're either a cobbler or a tailor or whatever, um, but some are a bit more difficult. So if you're a hammerman, that just means you're using a hammer, for example, a blacksmith. So it's, it could be quite a wide range of occupations. So you need to keep that in mind when you think about whether your ancestor may have been a member of one of the crafts. If it was a cordoner, it was those using leathers, so barkers and tanners. If it was a maltman, that included mealmen. Skinners included furriers and skinner um, as well. And masons included, um, I'm just trying to see this here because I've got this at the bottom. Um, and masons included a wide range of um, a wide range of occupations as well. The barbers, one of the things we, we may not like to think of, but very often our surgeons were barbers and that included in Glasgow. Um, so that's worthwhile thinking about. Why can't you find them? Very often people say that their ancestor was a, a right or their ancestor was a hammerman and they cannot find them in the records. Um, and one of the reasons you can't find them is what the craftsmen did in the Middle Ages they regulated who could work at each craft um, to control the numbers. It excluded people calling themselves craftsmen without the requisite skills. So how did you get those skills and how was that proven? They were, those eligible tended to be journeymen, i.e. they were fully trained um, and had served their, served their apprenticeship. Um, what that does is leave the vast majority ineligible for membership. So just keep that in mind. Your ancestor might have might have been in one of these occupations in terms of their title, but they were not necessarily allowed to be members of the particular crafts because of that qualification. Now, one of the first sources that we should talk about in terms of um, thinking about the merchants and craftsmen is the Burgess and the Burgess Rolls. Burgesses were original landowners and inhabitants who contributed to town and taxation and other burdens. So these were people who were um, substantial, they were paying taxes to the town and were occupying an important position within it. It later on became restricted to the merchants and craftsmen. Um, and the craftsmen obviously enjoyed privileges of trading or practicing a craft. And of course, what they, they enjoyed was the privilege of voting. And I mentioned I'm going to look a wee bit at some of the earlier voter rules where you may find um, your ancestors there. Later on, um, we have from the early 20th century, Glasgow decided to award, um, award a Burgess, um, this Burgess to those who fought in the Boer War, the two Boer Wars um, in South Africa. And there's a database of that in our family history website. In terms of Burgess Rose, there's also printed from 1573 to 1846. But of course, we've got the original records. And anything thereafter, you do need to use the archives. Those original records that they used to form those volumes, we have the council minutes. So they used them for 1573 to 1609. They used the Dina Guild Act book. They used the roll books, 1613 to 1956. And there's a roll book of ordinary Burgesses. And there's an index from 1800 to 1900. So you can see the actual Burgess um, printed volumes are actually uh, were compiled from a lot of different sources. But they do only go up to 1846. So what you need to do is use some other sources to be able to identify your ancestors. The picture I have there is the um, one from the Burgess Rolls. Um, and it just tells you in 2nd of June, 1852, Alexander Walker, merchants in Glasgow, um, is admitted to be a Burgess and Guild brethren of the borough of Glasgow, whose merchant and whose merchant was a younger son of William, um, William who was a Walker, who was a Burgess and Guild brethren. So you can actually see you're starting to see that um, family history link there, and um, because you're very often what you have is sons inheriting that from their fathers. So what kind of records can you find to find that elusive merchants um, or craftsmen? Let me start with the merchants. Um, and one of the things I should say about both of these, or both of these, both crafts and merchants, is that most they're very often a membership record. Um, but if there is not, you should always check the minute books because they may be listed there if they don't exist. 
So don't despair if you look at it and say, gosh, there's no membership list there. There are a lot of other sources, and I'm going to talk about those tonight. Also, like the merchants, the, many of the class have printed histories, which include membership lists. They're not always complete, so you should never depend on them. And they sometimes don't give you the same amount of information. But there are a number of these printed ones. You might even find some of them online nowadays. Um, it's always worthwhile having a look at that. But some of the most important records are financial records. These can be called various things. They can be called the collector's books. They can be called the quarterly and other accounts. And many of them record membership fees. And I'm going to look at some of them because sometimes they give you other crucial role. Not only do they establish a membership, but sometimes they can give you crucial information about your ancestor. And of course, one of the earliest things, there are apprenticeships from the 17th century. Um, so certainly if your ancestor was um, in terms of maybe a craftsman and you want to check about his mem how long, how far back that is and trace his history further back, there are some records lists apprenticeships and very interesting because of that. And of course, I did mention the charitable function. Um, and a lot of that charity was, of course, directed to their own members, poor members, or to people, um, their widows or whatever. So they gave a lot of donations to poor members, to pensioner members, or other charitable giving. This was often a routine activity from early times. So we've got the Merchants Old Men's Hospital, which is the drawing in the right-hand side. Um, which was built in the early 17th and 17th century. Um, and what's amazing is that Giving Glass was very great at filling, for, um, putting down its, um, pulling down many of its building. That steeple just, is just um, still survives. I'm not sure I even realised that myself till I was doing this and about a year and a half ago. And I parked just across from it. It's very, it's very interesting that all these things are around you, but you don't actually know what it is. Um, and the other thing they did was they had a lot of educational endowments, including Allen Glen School, which was a technical school. Um, and that was particularly one of the endowments for the Merchant's House. And what it did is include scholarships for study of medicine and arts. But Allen Glen's was certainly a technical school, so very important in terms of people wanting to study engineering or whatever. And during the First World War and thereafter, you will find lots of letters they had a a war relief fund, and you would find lots of letters, people asking um, for some support, um, either for themselves because they'd been at war, or maybe a widow who was looking for support because her husband had been killed there. So all sorts of different angles and different ways you can get into these, depending on what your ancestor did um, and their circumstances. I'm just looking here at the first uh, merchant's house here. Um, it's a date of entry, and um, it tells you this one here is about 1830s, um, and it gives you the name of the, the number, it gives you the date of entry, so you'll know when they became a man. It tells you, um, gives you their entry name, it tells you the designation and residence, and I'll be showing a few examples of this, and one of the things you should remember is they'll not always just be called merchants, and it'll be a bit more obvious when we look later on, but there's, there's a merchant there, um, some are called home traders and some are called foreign traders. I understand from the academics who um, do a lot of studying that, that the foreign trader does not necessarily mean that all their trade was with foreign or that that's what they did. Um, but it's certainly worthwhile thinking about that. And then it gives you the details. So this is where you start to get that information about ancestors. It gives you the details of the son of and his designation. So you've got a name of there. So this one here, green, is a Mr. Miller um, who gives you the details of his father. This one's a bit easier and it's a bit later, but they do go back, I should say the matriculations um, register, which are the memberships of the Merchant's House, go back in 1747. But this print, printed one makes it a lot easier, obviously, for you to be able to read it. And it tells you, again, the number, the year of the matriculation. It gives you the names. Um, and again, this is the one that makes it very clear how wide a range of occupations um, could be merchants, could be um, join the merchant's house and apply their um, merchant um, trade. So you get merchant there, you get a manufacturer, you get a writer, you get a manufacturer, 
you've got an oil merchant, you've got a ship owner, you've got an accountant. So quite a large number. So one of the things obviously we learn from that is you should not you should not say, well, they're not described as a merchant. You need to think about that in quite a wide way. And then it gives you the parents' names and designation. Um, and again, what's interesting about this is these are not just people from Glasgow. So if you look at this one, Alan, James Allen was a weaver from Westmuir, which is which is in um, Parkhead. But you look at John Thomas Alston, a merchant from Liverpool. Um, and it may well be that these merchants were trading from trading um, trading in Glasgow, um, and that's why they have joined the merchant's house there. And you can see Paisley, you can see Kilmarnock, you can see all these different occupations. Um, and you can, some of these names are actually the most famous within Glasgow's merchant history. Um, but it's just a point to remember is how wide you need to, a wider view you need to take of this and not too narrow a view because you might stop yourself finding one of your ancestors. I mentioned the surrounding areas that we have Merchant's House records for um, and other crafts. And so we have Anderson Weavers, um, and you can see the date for that. We've got the Calton Weavers, who were um, their accounts and membership. And um, the Govan Weavers, you can see the date there, and we've got them for Rutherglen. So those surrounding areas, Anderson, Calton, Govan, of course, we came into the city um, uh, at various dates. Um, Anderson, Calton, I think it was 1846, and Govan was 1912. But for a long time, they ran their own, um, their own merchants. Rutherglen did come in for a short time to Glasgow from 75 to 96, um, but no longer is. And this is a record here from, I think it's the Carlton. Um, and again, it just gives you details of the eight various members. So you know your, your ancestor was from that area. You may want to check that. You may discover, of course, that he, the ancestor, was also in Glasgow Weavers. I don't think they necessarily were on then one. And one of the really interesting things about Carlton Weavers, of course, um, there was a great strike in the 18th century, um, which caused, I think there was gunshot wounds, gunshots fired um, relating to that because the weavers in Carlton were suffering terribly for the, for the decline in their earnings. Um, and um, it led to a, a very important um, strike and a riot in the centre of Glasgow. Um, so again, something to think about. So again, just remember that it's not just Glasgow um, that we are talking about here. So all of them have um, a lot of them have merchant um, membership records. But one of the things I want to talk about is those other records that you might find either in the crafts or the merchant size, which may help you. And this is a collector's book, which is basically a fees a fees book. And this is the rights, and you can see the names here, um, and it's giving you. Um, telling you when they came in, it gives you their name. And if you look at the across there, it tells you when they're paying their fees. Now, when they stop paying your fees, it may, could mean anything, but very often it does mean that they have died. And it's really useful, particularly in that period, um, a, a bit before um, civil registration, when you can, and particularly even when no parish registers are terrible in terms of deaths, to actually have a, an idea when your ancestor might have died. And you can see that in this one page in three occasions, it's actually giving you the date of the, of the month of death um, of these rites. So a, a really great clue if your ancestors are right, it takes you on that way about how, when they had died, and you might want to check a lot of other things just to check, check what's happening. I mentioned all of it, also apprenticeships, and this is one for the Masons in 1826. They go much further back in that, um, and I will talk about the Borough Register of Deeds, which will have um, apprenticeship record apprenticeship um, records as well. But if you look here, you've got John Price as a weaver in Glasgow, and it's actually telling you about his he's signing up to be an apprentice, and it gives you all the details about that um, and who he was what who was. Who was, who was his master and what the, the agreement was. Again, quite interesting because it will give you something you might never discover elsewhere. I mean, I think um, Christine is absolutely right. One of the most important things about this is it takes you much further back um, than 1855 and sometimes centuries back. So that's what makes it really interesting. One of the things I also mentioned was that, that charitable giving. Um, and I did stress that very often it was to their own that they were giving the money. 
Um, so the merchants' houses were having petitions for assistance from the late 17th century, and not surprisingly, many of them for women from women whose husbands had died or um, who were ill, um, and their husbands would have been mem members of the merchants' house. And we've got these, as I say, we've got these petitions. It was really interesting. Um, Last week, one of the archivists put, um, it was archives, Explore Your Archives, and put up an annual report from the archives from the 1980s. And I never realised this, but one of the things that she found was that the key to the box that held these, um, held these um, petitions had been discovered after being missing for centuries. That was why we were able to get them, this huge box of amazing um, petitions. They often assisted pensioners, that's, that's um, the older members of the merchants' classes. They gave relief to the poor. Um, I mentioned that they had a war relief fund after World War I, and I mentioned a lot of these scholarships. And we're going to look at some of all of these things, or many of them. So for Alan Glenn's the study of arts, law, medicine at the university, some dating from the 17th century. So thinking about that in terms of um, maybe your ancestor you know that they went to university or you thought that they might have been at university or they went to Alan Klein School. That's one of the reasons for looking at these records because you might find further details there. And as I say, some of the apprenticeships are very early, right back to the 17th century. One of the ones that amazes me, partly because um, I've been doing this job a very long time, you never know, there's all this huge amount you never know. Um, and you always, it's not a day goes by, you don't find out something new. I mean, I was doing this, I think that was for last year for Christine, I think, or the year before, the Clyde Marine Society, which looks at like a nod thing. I don't know why it ended up in the uh, Merchant's House records, but the Clyde Marine Society, um, which, had, which was founded in 1758, they were founded to aid injured seamen or the kin of the sea seamen. So something you want to keep in mind if your ancestor was at sea um, and that you were looking to find information about them. The one below is a, one of the petitions, and it's from a Janet Miller, who was a poor woman, um, and she was given half a crown um, for her present sustenance. Um, and they, they gave her this warrant so that she would get that money. That was 1703. You will find, as I said, and particularly at this very early period, when it's very difficult to know about women, and I think one of the great things about a lot of the sources here in Merchants and Crafts, is that the details and the names of women um, are, are, are there to be discovered. Um, and sometimes these women you would not find anywhere else. And then this was Janet Miller, um, who's applying for that. So nice to see that. And there are lots of them there. The one to the right hand side is, um, again, the Masters of the Incorporation of Hammerman. And it gives you, again, all the details. And you can see them paying their money. Um, and when you stop paying their money, you know there's an issue. But again, just checking those membership lists is really a really good way of starting it. But again, I stress there are a lot of other, other ways of finding it. Um, and these fees are like that, but also check the minutes. Um, but a really good source for you. And another one is a completed list of pensioners for the Merchant's House and their quarterly meeting in March people in 1781. And so you've got a James Connell there, a Patrick Mitchell, and you've got Mrs. Hamilton, and you've got James Bogle, son of, and tell you the son of them, the Bogles, George Black, you've got a Margaret Wilson, who's the widow of Richie. So again, you're starting to get women's names and this is 1781. Um, you've got the wife, sometimes it just says the wife, but sometimes you actually get the, um, first name, and sometimes you even get their maiden name as well. So just worthwhile looking through, spending a bit of time in the city archive and just having a look through all of these just to see what you can discover. This is another pensioners one, and it's the coordinates, and it gives you quite a lot of detail. It tells you when they entered, um, it gives you their name, obviously, and it gives you other details about them. So all the details you want to know about their membership. What's really interesting, this one here is a young person who's still at school. What's really interesting here is that they're actually giving you some comments. Um, so this pension is a very respectable person and keeps a tidy, clean house and well-deserved the sympathy of the master court. 
She has two stepsons living living with her who are uh, uh, members of the incorporation um, of Cordoners. Um, so you can see it's that family connection, she's getting money, but we now know this person's got two stepsons um, and that they're members. Um, so that's really quite an important point there. And if you look, sometimes it gives you the names of grandchildren at trade schools as well. So there's all sorts of ways you can find um, different generations of the one family. Now, I mentioned the Clyde Marine Society there, and um, it's quite a, very useful indeed, um, and it goes quite far back. Um, if we just look at some of them here, we've got Elizabeth Lang, who's a relic of James Lang, a mariner, um, who she gets five shillings a quarter, which is quite a lot of money. But we now know this person, um, we know her husband has died, but we get a note of the woman's name here. The, we've got Janet Warden, and one of them here is um, one of them here is actually a sailor himself who has been injured. Um, so again, think about the Clyde Marine and think about yeah, whether your ancestor was at sea. I mean, there are some sources for that. Um, and look at the one here is Janet Muir, who's a relic of the widow of James McGuffey, who had been a ship master, um, and that was 10 shillings a quarter. Now, this is a bit earlier than the list of masters from 1854 when there was list of captains kept um, in registers. So very useful just to look at that as well. I want to talk about some of the other records that we might use. Um, so you would certainly be starting with those actual records from the, the, the organisations, either the individual crafts or the, the merchant's house. Um, but of course, one of the things I mentioned is particularly the merchants were really important in terms of the city's governance. Um, the Glasgow City Council minutes survived in 1574. Lots of them were officials in the council. They were influencing development, for example, the river, the ports, the roads. Um, and one of the things they always say when we're looking at the legacies of empire and the slavery, follow the money. Um, so these were the people deciding, for instance, that um, they, they would acquire Port Glasgow, that could be Glasgow's port because the clay wasn't deep enough at the time. Um, these were the people who agreed that roads would be built. Um, but these those minutes for some of these years are, are print, the printed minutes are actually one line. Um, so worthwhile checking if you just want to look, if you think your ancestor was involved in that, may have been an official in the council, it's worthwhile just checking those. The other important thing about them was that they were, we've seen very obviously that all families, all but the same families as that kinship. Um, kinship element, but there's also a lot of social mobility in the merchants class. They mixed socially, did the same thing. They would go to the dances together in, in the assembly room. They tended to marry closely among themselves, so there's a lot of contact there. Very often they attended some of the church. So one of the things about the, the various branches of the Presbyterian churches, some of them are quite social, particular social classes would attend particular types of churches. Um, and you will see a lot of them going to the same church. And of course, they belong to the same group, some of whose records we have, and I'm just going to mention a couple of those. So we have the records of the Chamber of Commerce, which was established in 1783. It is the oldest English speaking um, Chamber of Commerce across the world um, whose records survive. Um, and we've got them from 1783. They were dealing with trade dishes like of the time like America and tobacco, um, but a lot of the people who are in the merchant's house would also be in the Chamber of Commerce. They may also have been members of the West India Association, which was founded in 1807. That was a lobby, lobbying group against the, ab against the, the abolition of slavery, um, which was set up and that was the year the slavery was abolished. And then there's, on the other side is the East India Association, again, which dealt with commerce and industry. You may find that a lot of your ancestors were one or all of these groups, so it's certainly worthwhile checking that as well. Now, I mentioned in terms of burials um, and um, in terms of merchants and crafts, and of course, in Necropolis, um, which I don't know how many of you visited it, but, but it is amazing, an amazing, um, an amazing burial cemetery, um, and certainly a, a great location. It belonged to the merchant's house. It originally was the first park, um, and in 1832-33, they turned the park into a cemetery, and there are internment registers and layers from 1832. 
So it's certainly worthwhile thinking about that as well. Um, just about looking at those, there'll be lots some of these merchants would have been buried there in that early period. There are internments for Carlton Cemetery from 1841, and there are Carlton Reeve and Mort, um, Mortcloth books um, for the, that kind of period as well. If you don't know about the Mortcloth, what happened was um, that was the black cloth that was put in the body um, of um, somebody who died, they would put that on the body of them. Um, now, you could actually hire them usually from Kirch Session, so that's one of the ways that would help you discover the date of death of someone. Um, but Often people didn't need to hire them because they belonged to one of these organisations and you could get them for free. And if you look at the right hand side there, we just see some of the big buildings. I'll just look at this one here. That is what is now Trongate. Um, the building there um, with William, King Williams, that's sitting in front of it there, was the, it became, this is the Trongate here. This was the Trongate built in 1628, which was the seat of Glasgow government. And of course, they had to add this. Um, it became over here that became there as well. And um, that's became where the government was in terms of local government and where Glasgow would have met and where the archives were kept in both cases as well. So just to look at the necropolis um, in internments here. Um, so we get the date of the burial. We've got the name and designation. Um, tells you what the, the, uh, the reason for death is gives you their age and whether they're um, male or female. Um, and it also tells you the family, whether it's a family ground and where they are actually buried and whether it's a single grave um, and um, it tells you who owned it. Now, some of the ones, what's really interesting about the, I'm going to talk, what's really interesting about some of the 1850s internment registers, it actually tells you like, how many coaches are wearing, how many horses and it will give you the undertakers as well. So that's really a useful thing to know. So here's a section from the lay register in 1848 from Necropolis. Those four square yards and one half square yard of ground delineated on the cemetery um, and just gives you the actual, the actual detail about where that um, grave is. Um, so really useful, if, again, if you want to just discover exactly where your ancestor was buried in the necropolis. And the city archives has the records of all the necropolis, both the actual council corporation in terms of the cemeteries, but we have these additional ones from the merchant's house, which add a bit of detail. So it's always worthwhile checking. And here's Calton Cemetery, and it gives you a layered register there. And if you look, it also gives you the internment register. So if you think your ancestor was born there, and to, particularly if it's a Celtic weaver, you may decide that you want to check there if you're in doubt about whether they actually, um, where they were buried, which is often the case, obviously. I want to turn to some more general um, records which will feature the merchants and the trade, the merchants and craftsmen. Um, and some of these are around legal property and contracts. And a lot of the merchants have close connections with the land. They're the elite inheriting and acquiring estates. We've got large numbers of the landed gentry. Um, so, for instance, we've got the Pollock House records for the Maxwells of Pollock. We've got Smiths of Jordan Hill. We've got them from quite a, quite a far wide range across the west of Scotland. So we have them for Lanarkshire and Bartonshire, as well as Glasgow and Renfrewshire. Um, so it is worthwhile looking because a lot of these merchants um, would inherit those estates, but they would work out, they would work, their businesses would be worked out of Glasgow. And of course, a lot of them would join the merchants' classes in the merchants' house. And of course, a lot of you will have already used the Satan's registers, which is the transfer of property. Um, and we have the borough registers for Glasgow from 1690s. Um, and we have to 1927, and we've got the abstracts for the whole of Strathclyde from 1781 to 1980s. So again, if you're interested to see that property transfer, and a lot of these, these individuals would have owned property. And then there's a border register of deeds. I should say a lot of the seasons, and most of the seasons are held in the National Records of Scotland, and most of the border register of deeds. Glasgow being Glasgow, Glasgow did not hand them over. In 1927, they were asked if they wanted to, to and they said no, we're keeping their own. Um, but 
there's an advantage of that means they're held locally. The disadvantage is that some of the like they're not part of the abstract of Bridgman Assassins, um, but we're delighted to have them. But it is worthwhile looking <coughs> looking at those to see if you can discover your ancestor. And a great way to doing that is to check whether they when they died, because that's obviously when they might have the property might have been transferred, or perhaps if they emigrated. Um, went across um, the world to somebody else, again, you might see it there. Um, and they, they might show you when they bought it, but it's certainly worthwhile looking at those as well. And the Borough Register of Deeds um, is a record. People would record the deeds there in um, the Borough Register of Deeds. Um, it didn't have the same legal, it didn't actually, so they, sometimes you get wills there. Um, but one of the reasons they do it, it gives it a bit of legal certainty. So you'll get apprenticeships there, you'll get wills, the number the joint stock companies, and a lot of these are merchants who join together to um, ply their trade across the world. Um, and what it did is give them some legal protection, which is why they did it. So certainly another source worthwhile looking at. Some of the other sources you'll be more familiar with are voters and valuation roles. Um, I think it's really important to think about how few people had a vote in Scotland before the 32 Reform Act. If you can see in 1831, it was less than 5,000. 1832, after the Act, it went up a bit, but it's still quite small. Um, but a lot of the people that you, people that you were talking about today, may well have had the vote. So we've got a lot of 18th and 19th century voters' roles, um, and both for Glasgow, but other areas, a lot of these are held as part of the landed family estates. We've got valuation rules for 18th and 19th century. Again, I should say to you that some of the earliest, the earliest of these are 17th century. Um, the best of those early ones are the National Records of Scotland. Um, they vary enormously in the type of information they give you. Sometimes they will tell you only the name of the, they'll tell you only the name of the estate or the value of the state. Sometimes they'll only give you the owner, but sometimes they will also give you the tenants. Um, so it's certainly worthwhile thinking about that as well because you may find a lot of your merchant ancestors there. So there's all sorts of different things which will allow you to either know where your ancestors think about using the merchants or perhaps adding value to what you've already thought of or got through the merchant records themselves. I mentioned the family and estate records. Without a doubt, these are some of our most valuable, and most important records. They date from the 13th century to the 20th century. We've got them right across the whole of Scotland, the west of Scotland and beyond. The beyond is we have some for Perthshire, which is the stilling of Keir and Corda, and that's a related, they're related to the Maxwell's of Pollock. What do they have? They've got titles and legal papers. They've got correspondence, some of them right back to the 16th century. Estate records, rentals and leases. Now, normally I would say that obviously most of our families are not related to the landed families here. Um, and what we're looking at is things like rentals and leases. Um, but a lot of these merchants are actually may well have been um, applying their trade. So if I look at Stilling of Cairn Corda, which is our most important collection in terms of um, plantation owning, um, it, um, so that's a re really important part of that there. Um, selling a Cairn Corda it is a huge collection and you will see those although it's a landed family a lot of the younger sons went abroad and a lot of them had set up companies and were working through working out of Glasgow Lennox of Woodhead is the same and Smith of Jordan Hill a lot of these families actually were heavily involved in the merchants classes in the 17th, 18th and 19th century And that's just the Stillings of Keir, and just that's his that wonderful house in Perthshire, um, Stilling of Keir and Corda. The reason I show that, if you think you're related to some of these landed families, a lot of these are online. So again, something worthwhile checking. And here is all country houses. Um, there's one, these exist for a lot of the areas across Scotland. This is the old country houses for all Glasgow gentry. There's the castle, castles and mansions of Renfrewshire. There's the same for Ayrshire. Very often what these merchants did, um, either they came from a landed family and already had houses, but very often they used their profits um, from, um, their, from their trade to actually go and build a house, um, build a house in the country areas. 
and there's a couple of these there. That's a, a beautiful volume. All the photographs of those houses are on our virtual Mitchell. Um, but what's really good about them is they actually give you a whole history of the house and the different families that lived there. Um, so you could think about that if your merchant's cows and ha merchant's ancestors are doing really well. Very often what they did was they moved out of the city um, and lived in these country houses, but they actually, their businesses were run from Glasgow. And just to fi finish off, um, I think the really important thing about merchants and craftsmen, they're part of the civic Glasgow. They helped to shape the city. There's no doubt about that. Um, Glasgow would not have been what it is um, if it was not for the merchants and the craftsmen um, that made um, the buildings in terms of the craftsmen and the merchants who actually um, brought huge amounts of money into it. Um, not quite as important any of them as St Mungo, who was the founder of the city and whose legacy actually shaped the city from the 12th century. Um, what do they do? They tell you the story of its members. What's really interesting about them? You also find the details of their widows and their children from the 17th and 20th century. And I know many of you, when you're doing your family history, the most frustrating part is when you go pre-1855 or further back, how difficult it is. So we need to think about wider the types of sources we might use, just in case we've got an ancestor that might come into that category um, and worthwhile checking all of those records. I mentioned the amazing family and estate records from the 13th to 20th century. Um, but we also have a lot of records of the individual merchants. Um, and current, when I say currently, I have started doing a thing looking at um, Legacy of Empire and detailing, looking at all these merchants and um, checking it out in their catalogue and finding huge numbers of letters and things about them. Um, and sometimes directly related, for instance, their trade in Virginia or the trade in Jamaica or whatever. Um, but I trade the trade across the world. So there's lots of individual letters that you might be able to find. Even if there's not a collection that's only about them, you'll discover lots of things there. I don't think there's any doubt their history and their story is the history and story of Glasgow and Scotland and its citizens. Um, they're such a vital part of the city's history. And although I'm talking about Glasgow, these merchants and craftsmen across Scotland and the, and the big boroughs would, be, would have existed and they would perform something of the same role. Um, and the records will probably show much the same thing. So definitely think about that. But also remember there might have been merchants elsewhere but because Glasgow was the centre of, um, centre of um, the growth in terms of that worldwide trade. They may have been working from Glasgow rather than from elsewhere. And I'm just going to show you how to contact us. Um, you've got the address there in City Archives. Um, we've got an email, archives at glasgowlife.org.uk. And we do show a Twitter account and we've got a Facebook account. Um, we're very active in both Twitter and Facebook. Um, um, showing images and describing records that we have. So certainly worth something to follow um, if you're interested in your family, family history. I should say that we, I did mention earlier the family history website. We are looking at, we, um, I was at a meeting yesterday and over the next year we're looking at um, transferring it and migrating it, but making some important changes which will make it a lot easier to use and a lot easier to find things in. So thank you very much. Wonderful, just wonderful. Amazing. Um, and you know what? It's not just family history when you've got on Facebook and Twitter. There's a lot of history history. We do a lot. We do and social history. A lot of social yeah. history. And um, we deliberately do that, you know. We deliberately challenge the thought that our marketing that people only want to read three lines, do you know? So sometimes, <laughs> sometimes we do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I've done the history of the city from the beginning, the growth, right, and just done a whole series. We've done a lot of things like that, you know. Um, so it's and lovely. some of the archives too, right around Scotland, will have um, like a theme that they follow for a month or whatever, or you know, once yeah. a week or something. They'll have something out. Those are always fun as well. They are, and there's a kind of UK archive. Often it's a UK theme, and we all we always would contribute to that. And most archives would, yeah, yeah. I was, um, I was actually quite delighted that you mentioned Alan Glenn's school because when I mention that to anybody, nobody knows what I'm talking about. And oh, my right. dad actually was offered a place there in the 1950s. 
All right, yeah. And yeah. He, he kind of knocked it back because he lived quite far away and it would mm -hmm. have meant, you know, a lot of buses and different yeah. things to actually yeah. get there. Yeah. And he felt it was quite a lot. And he'd be away from his friends and um, Rhea refused it. It just uh -huh. makes you wonder uh -huh. what he would have went on to do. But they came. They became a. I mean, it became a Glasgow Corporation School in the end. Um, right. And um, but yes, it's got a long, a long and illustrious history. Um, I must say, and quite a lot of them would have joined together the first world when the first world war as well. Yeah. Yeah. Quite interesting. But yeah, looking at these records, I mean, I, I actually I've got a family in Glasgow. I don't know. I've got you know my ancestor. I don't know what set of parents is his. Mm -hmm. And I'm back to about 1720. The parish records have kind of dropped out, and I've been actually sitting between wills and um, trade records. And actually, the amount of information mm -hmm. that I'm at, I'm able to piece together on these two families mm -hmm. has been unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. You know, who the children married, and you know who their parents were, and yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm hoping that actually in doing that and looking at some of these records, I might find the link that I'm looking for. Yeah. <laughs> I think you just need to keep going. I know, <laughs> I know, I know. Never give it. up, because it'll it. happen for you sometime. Obviously. Oh, I know, I know. So we've had quite a lot of people watching tonight. We've got, um, I'm just looking at where everybody's watching from tonight. We've got Inverurie, quite a few from Canada. We've got um, Calgary, London, Ontario, Nova Scotia, Suffolk. I must be the Christine fans. Aye. <laughs> Suffolk, we've got Tennessee, Oregon, Ayrshire. Yeah, we've got quite a few. Mm -hmm. So that's great. So I think Christine's going to run through some questions yeah. and I'm going to put some notes into the chat box right. um, about the next webinar, etc. So question on crafts. I have Colton Weaver ancestors. One married the daughter of a nailer who had a lair in Colton Weaver's burial ground. Oh, she's done all her work. <laughs> aye, where they were buried. Would a nailer have been classed as one of the one of the? I, I think know. it could have been a hammerman, but oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it could have been a hammerman. Um, it's not always easy to tell, but I think that might have been the most obvious. If he was, um, but it's worthwhile. It's always worthwhile checking. I must say. I actually love the cemetery, the Colton Weaver Cemetery. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, they had for yeah. homecoming, I think it was in 2014. It was fabulous. Uh -huh. 2019, whenever the most yeah. recent one was. And then it's just all grown over now, but it's still fascinating to go I through. Know. No, it is well, it's certainly, um, it's certainly worthwhile visiting. Yeah. Um, are these types of records only available in larger cities? My ancestor was a shoemaker in Jedburgh. I I would say that the, and I, I don't want to say that I know all about it. <laughs> they tend to be boroughs, so you would have them in big boroughs. It is worthwhile just checking the local local archives to see um, to see whether they have either the equivalent. You know, um, they they were certainly part of a kind of a bigger borough, but they obviously would have had those and who could do in these other places. I would always check just to ask the archivist there. Um, I'm sure they'll know. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, uh, in the moment, that's it. One, one lady said that she was very um, interested in the topic because her ancestor was a calendar, ca calendar, cal Cal I don't know. Yeah. calendar, I think that's to do with Candler. fabrics and... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was thinking when I first saw it, I thought candle maker, and then I read it and thought that's not exactly it at all. <laughs> I saw that. I think it, I think it's to do with someone that goes in and cleans the bedding, all the bedding that came from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe not, uh, but uh -huh. I'm sure there's other sources that they may have that might be useful for that. Would merchants and craftsmen in and around Canvas Lang be included in the Glasgow City Archives? I think they would be in terms. The I think if they were merchants, they would definitely be. If they were going to be doing that, they would be joining. If they were able to, they would have joined it. You can see from the list that they came from all sorts of different places, so it's definitely worthwhile checking. Um, the crafts, a lot of people, it's not far away, but the craftsmen obviously. Um, they did restrict numbers, but it's not that far away that they might have joined some of the Glasgow cat, the one of those crafts. And I would always just check that um, just to be absolutely sure. Um, oh. I mean, the other thing is to check directories, both in Glasgow, but also in these other places. Um, and they're online, a lot of the directories. Um, they're online um, 
any less Scotland to 1912, but others have put them up later than that. It's worth well checking to see what your ancestor was listed as. So the cal calendar or whatever it is, is a textile finisher, fabric yeah. finisher. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I learned mm -hmm. something today. Day's not an entire waste. You learn something. Yeah. <laughs> Every day is a school day. <laughs> um, so there's still a minute to put any questions into the, the chat box if you're looking. Oh, wait a minute. John's got one in. A bit off today's subjects, but do you have Covenanter records? He's looking for John Yuri's wife's name and child who presented a petition after her husband was shot in Pomody. In Pomody, mm -hmm. it's we don't have a series of Covenanters records. I just think you'd be looking at the individual to see um, whether it's come up either in the minutes of the council or in anything else. It's just worthwhile looking at that. Pomody's just. Mm -hmm. Was it? Yeah. Could you I run around and take it. a photo, please? <laughs> yeah. There's not much to see. There's a big, um, big disposal, <laughs> disposal place, not much else. Um, so, still a minute to put any questions into the chat. Just a quick point that our next webinar will take place on the 10th of March. The speaker will be Donna Moore of the Women's Library, and you can find the link to sign up now in the chat box. We will send it out, obviously, on the e-news as well. Um, remember that if you're not already a member of Lanarkshire Family History Society, then why not join now? Annual mm -hmm. membership ranges from £10 to £16. Mm -hmm. You receive three journals per year, monthly e-news and use of the Society's Research Centre in Motherwell. And I've put more details into the chat box for that as well. And kinship and friendship, like we found. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, we got a friendship during lockdown, yeah. didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> we did, indeed. Uh, let's see, we've got another couple of things here. Very interesting presentation. Mary's saying, when a craft... Oh, wait a minute, it keeps jumping the, craft, the, the ball. I know. When a craft work closed down, would the records be deposited in the Mitchell? So Sorry, I think it's just meaning when a business closed down. No. Well, they could be in terms of business records, both ourselves and the University of Glasgow have yeah, really large good. numbers of records. Mm -hmm. If they, I would always check, because I think I did the one about business records and family history the other week there. Um, and one of the things I would say you always suggest you do as well, they might have gone bankrupt um, and you would maybe want to check sequestration records in the National Records of Scotland, mm -hmm. though we have some for the borough of Glasgow as well. Mm -hmm. The advantage of the National Records of Scotland, because they have the court records, and we do have some volumes like that. Very often the records of the company were presented as part of the evidence, so it's certainly worthwhile checking that as well. Yeah. Um, but we have huge numbers of business records. I think we've got about six or 700 yeah. collections. Yeah. Uh, many of them are around shipbuilding and engineering, but not everything. There's a lot of other occupations there, or other businesses. Yeah. You've um, got yeah, a fan here. another great presentation by Dr. Yeah. O'Brien. <laughs> <laughs> and you get I think the Gazette obviously you get announcements for businesses right mm -hmm. um closing down as well but yeah no Glasgow Glasgow Uni has got a lot of business archives and I think you can look up their indexes online yeah yeah um we probably that's what they specialize in but the very first city archivist was very clear and they wrote an article on it that he would not be seeding the the right to collect business records because we were the city archives and we would continue to do it so and that's Hello. what he did so we're yeah no hey, all of our quiet yeah mm -hmm. oh. are there okay. indexes for uh the likes of the merchant house books do you mean there are met there are catalogues and there are indexes um our catalogues are not yet online. Um, I'm not talking about how bad IT is in the city just now. It's we've we'll got them ready, but yes, we do have catalogues for them. And if you're looking for something, somebody could download a bit for you as well. But the, there is full; they are fully listed. All the merchants and crafts records are fully listed. Okay. Okay. I don't think there's any more questions. Just lots of thanks coming in but that was an amazing presentation i'd like to thank you on behalf of lanarkshire family history society mm -hmm. for your presentation tonight irene okay no problem thank you Wonderful. very much okay. and we look forward to seeing everybody next month right and okay good to see you